Well, hi, everybody. Welcome to our Northern Colorado Library series. We're so glad that you're here and we're very appreciative to both the Clearview Library in Windsor and also the Loveland Library in Loveland for helping support these classes. We realize you may not live in Northern uh, Colorado, but we welcome you anyway. And we do this every month on the second Wednesday at 1230. And next month, please join us because we have a very special presenter coming, Dr. Jim Klett. If you are familiar with CSU Horticulture, Dr. Klett is really the, he's the guy. He's the ornamental plant specialist. He'll be retiring in about a year or so. So get on to see Dr. Klett and I'll put the link to join in the chat. So what we're doing today is we are doing common weeds of the front range and I'll introduce Amy in one second, but I do wanna do a couple housekeeping things. The chat is open and if you do have questions, please send them to either everyone or myself or Tony. We'll be handling the questions. Don't direct message Amy. She won't be able to see them and she won't be able to answer them. So do do that. Please respect the topic at hand. We know that you have lots of gardening questions and if you have topics other than weeds, we do ask you to reach out to either your local extension agent or your master gardeners to get those answered. So please stick to the topic at hand. Uh, if we feel that there's a security breach, we will end the meeting, wait a few minutes and then rejoin. We don't anticipate that happening, uh, but just in case we feel something went awry, please be aware of that. So without further ado, I am so pleased to introduce you to Ms. Amy Lentz. Amy is the agriculture and horticulture agent in Weld County, and she's going to talk about common weeds of our landscape. So take it away, Amy. Great, okay. thank you so much, Allison, for the nice introduction. Thank you to all of you for joining us today. Um, I was shocked to see that there were so many people excited to hear about weeds um, because they're just one of those things that we have to deal with. So um, as Allison mentioned, I'm the horticulture and agriculture agent in Weld County. And over the past five years since I've um, joined Extension here in Colorado, um, I've been covering small acreage management as well as horticulture and agriculture. And that allows me to go out to people's properties and help them identify weeds and talk to them about management. And so um, I, I was kind of excited to make this presentation because I get to use a lot of the pictures that I've taken over the past five years. Um, so I'm gonna share all that with you today and we'll get started. So, there we go. So let's start out with just the basics. I always like to start with the basics. Um, everybody's at different learning levels, so um, you never know where to start. But let's start with what is a weed? And so a weed is really any plant that becomes undesirable in the landscape because of the following. That can be because it's growing in a place where it is unwanted, whether that be a lawn, um, in your flower beds, in a pasture setting. They often outcompete more desirable plants in the home landscape or it escapes into native landscapes. So that makes it a weed. They can act as a host or a shelter for other types of pests. And so sometimes um, it may not be that it's outcompeting something, but it is, it is that host species that we need to monitor and, and eradicate. They can be visually unattractive. They can also be visually attractive, which can cause some issues with people wanting to plant them. But typically, you know, they're gonna have a, an off color, maybe a, a poor texture, growth habit that's not very attractive or a really fast growth rate that's unable, that you're unable to control. And then finally, they can pose a health or a safety concern to us as humans um, or to the environment. So whether it be a poisonous plant, maybe it's got thorns on it, um, a lot of times, especially here in the West, there are some, um, some weeds that are weeds because they're a threat of fire as well. So I always like to show in the pictures here what we're looking at. This is Western salsify, cheatgrass, and field bindweed. Um, this was in a, a pasture kind of near Windsor. Um, and so, yeah, you can have a multitude of problems at once. So why are weeds so successful? And pardon me, I'm going to pop my camera off just so that y'all can um, concentrate more on the presentation. So why are weeds so successful? Well, that's because they are more ecologically fit than other plants in our landscape. And what that means is that they can have things like a fast or rapid growth rate. 
They can be prolific seed producers, um, creating what we call seed banks. And we're going to talk more about that in just a little bit. Sometimes their seeds have a very long lifespan and they can remain viable for several years. They have deep roots, deep stolons or tubers, um, those root systems making them tolerant of adverse growing conditions where other plants may not be able to grow. They're very adapted to readily spread. Many of these have um, mechanisms that help their seeds spread far and wide. As I mentioned, they can be adapted to those disturbed soils or disturbed sites. They can have insects or they may not have insects, excuse me, that, or diseases that will keep them in check like other plants. So there, a lot of times they'll be insect um, resistant or disease resistant. They can be better competitors for things like light, nutrients, and water that your good plants, your desirable plants are trying to also get to. And so um, let's talk a little bit about that weed seed bank. And so as a plant or a weed drops its seed into the soil over many years, it builds up what we call this weed seed bank. And these seeds, as I mentioned, can remain viable for many, many years. And so really persistence and vigilance are gonna be the two steps that are very necessary into keeping those weeds from going to seed and then um, creating more of that seed bank. And, and your goal here is really to deplete that seed bank. So you have to be persistent, you have to be vigilant and keep those weeds from going to seed. And so here's a study um, that was done and you can see in this chart here, a few different popular weed species. Um, most of these are common in Colorado and you can see just how many seeds are produced per plant. In the case of purslane, this, um, this particular chart shows over a million, almost 2 million seeds per plant. Now, is that all the time? I don't know, probably not. Maybe it's only a couple hundred thousand, but that's still a lot of seeds per plant. And then also look at the longevity of those seeds. Um, for that same purslane, you're looking at 20 to 25 years, or um, in the case of, of puncture vine, 15 to 20 years, or some of these even more than 40 years. Um, I don't know about you, but I don't plan to live in my house for 40 more years. Maybe you do, um, but I'm going to be battling those weeds the entire time because it's, it's really just um, ha has a lot to do with that weed seed bank. And so how do we get these weeds into our landscapes? There's, there's different ways this can happen. Here are some of the major sources of how those weeds end up in your landscape. They can be present on weeds currently growing that are going to seed. So again, persistence and vigilance is important. Monitoring is important. They can be disseminated from a neighboring property that you have no control over. This is probably the most common way that you're getting them into your yards. Um, they can be brought into the garden in, in manure and soil amendments. So it's always important to be looking for weed-free manure or weed-free soil amendments or as close to that as you can get. Um, and then sometimes, like I mentioned, they're deliberate introductions. Some of these weeds have attractive flowers that people want to put in their garden. Um, not a good idea. And in some cases uh, can be going against our noxious weed, our noxious weed um, regulations. There are minor sources of weeds getting into the landscape as well. These can include things that are brought into the garden on other plant materials, although this is not as common because uh, typically your nurseries are watching for that and they're keeping those materials weed free. They can be brought in by irrigation water, animals, humans, again, more of a minor source, or they can be every now and then brought in even using quality seed that's typically weed free. Um, but I will say that um, seeds go through a lot of regulatory processes and if they're sold in the stores, they've been checked by, um, by regulators um, periodically. So that's not usually how you get them into your landscape, but it does happen. And then how do you deal with those weeds in the landscape? And really, I want you guys to be thinking more of management instead of control. Like I said, this is a long-term thing. Some of these weed seeds last for years upon years. And so to think that you're going to control them, it kind of sets you up for failure because it's really, um, you're going to be controlling them temporarily. I like to think of it more as management, but I'll use both of these terms interchangeably throughout the rest of today's class. So I said, let's think of it as management. And the way that we like to do that um, in the university system is through what's called integrated pest management. And, um, you know, it's a big term. It's, it sounds complicated, but it's really not. It's mostly common sense. 
And so um, this definition comes to us from the USDA and it basically says that IPM uses knowledge of pest and host biology in combination with biological and environmental monitoring. And then you can implement these management tactics. And these management tactics that you're gonna be using are there to prevent unacceptable levels of pest damage because you don't want weeds in your yard. They're gonna help you minimize the risk to people, property, infrastructure, the environment, our natural resources. These management strategies will also reduce the evolution of pest resistance to pesticides and other pest management practices. And I'm gonna to touch on this just a little bit more um, in this chart that you can see here. So, um, and I'm not gonna be going into specific chemicals for specific plants, but I do wanna to touch on this herbicide resistance factor. And so you can see in the chart there, the upper left-hand photo shows herbicide being sprayed on, a, on a, a group of weeds. And then there's that one weed that doesn't die from that herbicide. That would be a resistant plant. And then that plant grows up, survives, sets its own seed. And then as those seeds germinate, um, a portion of them are also going to be resistant to that same chemical. And so as you spray again, you kill off all the ones that are non-resistant, leaving the ones that are resistant. And again, those are going to set seeds. So eventually you get to this point where you can have some resistance in the majority of your weed population. Um, this is more typical in agronomic situations or situations where they're trying to manage large properties, um, but it does happen. And so what we do to kind of combat that a little bit is consider different modes of action of different herbicides. So switching up your herbicides into these different action groups. And there's charts for this. There's several different action groups for herbicides. I think there's probably close to 20 or, or so. Um, and it's very complex. And again, I like to say that we're going to use other tools in our toolbox before we use um, chemical options. But if you do use them, I just want to point this out that there are um, there are various research projects and, and there's a lot of research out there to help you make good decisions if that's the way you want to go. But as I mentioned, with integrated pest management, we're really looking for a more sustainable approach to managing these pests. And we do that by combining different techniques that start out at the bottom of this pyramid with prevention and cultural control. But as you move up this pyramid, um, then you might do some physical or mechanical control, or you might consider biological control. Um, but these different types of tools are going to help us minimize those risks. And notice that chemical control is your last option at the top. So actually, let me stop real quick. I can see that the chat box has been uh, chiming. Allison or Tony, any questions I need to address right off the bat here? Uh, no, oh. not just that you'll be addressing in specific weeds. So people are asking ahead of what you're going to be talking about. Okay. So folks, yeah, folks just need to be a little patient. Great. Yeah, we're going to cover a lot of different um, common weeds that you will see in your landscapes. And um, yeah, so we'll get there. All right, so let's start at the bottom of this pyramid and let's work our way up. So how can you help prevent weeds using IPM? You can do different things like planting weed-free seed, which we talked about at the beginning that typically doesn't have any weed seeds in it. You can avoid invasive plant species as much as possible, you know, keeping them out of your landscape, monitoring them around your landscape. Choose weed-free amendments. This is one area where you can really introduce a lot of weed seeds into your garden or into your vegetable garden if you're using um, amendments that aren't very well cared for or monitored before you buy them. So check around, ask around, and, and try to find things that are weed-free as much as possible. You can use mulches where it's appropriate. And this is really one of the, I think, one of the best ways to prevent weeds. Um, here you can see three different mulch types used in different situations. If you're growing vegetables, you can use straw as a mulch. You can use grass clippings as a mulch to help suppress those weeds. Um, you could even use what's called black plastic, um, which is a plastic mulch to help suppress those weeds and keep them from competing with your veggie plants. Or you can use the mulch, um, the bark mulch that you get at the landscape stores or um, maybe from your local municipality to help suppress weeds in your landscape beds. Another way you can prevent weeds is through maintaining healthy and competitive plants. 
if you've got good plants growing, they're going to be taking up that space where a weed might normally show up. So always maintaining healthy plants, a healthy lawn also um, is going to be important for out competing those weeds. And then in the case of lawns, um, you want to be irrigating and fertilizing appropriately because that can also have an impact on the amount of weeds that you see in that sort of a situation. So we're gonna move our way again up this pyramid, as you can see in that lower corner into the cultural methods. And really cultural methods and prevention go hand in hand. So there's a lot of repetition here between these two. But things that you can think about in terms of irrigation is that your irrigation amount and the frequency that you irrigate can have a direct influence on how many weeds you see in your, um, in your uh, lawn, for example where you might be irrigating an entire area and wetting that entire area that can encourage weed seed germination, but you could try drip irrigation in some situations like in a, a vegetable garden situation. And that can help discourage weeds by just keeping the soil dry in areas that you aren't planting desirable plants. Lawn mowing um, is another important way that you can keep those weeds down a little bit. Um, Tony Koski does a great class on lawn care and in there he talks about this fine fescue mowing height study where when you mow too low and too often um, at that low height you can start to get some weed seeds, uh, weeds creeping in like crabgrass and yellow foxtail. Um, so don't mow too short um, and you can mow high and that will help create a healthier lawn and more competition for those weeds. I mentioned mulching already, um, but I do wanna touch just briefly on landscape fabrics because some people think that these are really helpful to keep weeds down when in fact, um, they can prevent the breakdown in organic matter in your soil. They can decrease your plant vigor. And if weeds start to germinate above that, they throw their taproot down below the landscape fabric. And then when you go to pull that, oftentimes you'll just be pulling the top portion and leaving the root, which then can then turn into another weed. And then, as I mentioned, these cultural methods and prevention go hand in hand and that crop competition is another way to keep weeds down. So moving up the pyramid next, our next option is then going to be to move into mechanical methods of, con of control or management. And so this can be done with things like tilling or cultivating, and this can effectively control 90% of annual or biennial weeds if you do this before they set seeds. Um, but you want to use shallow cultivation if possible, because the more you do deep tilling, you're bringing weed seeds up to the surface. And so um, you might be getting rid of the weeds on the surface, but then you're pulling new weed seeds up. So I like to use what's in the top picture there. This is called a stirrup hoe. Um, it just really just brushes underneath the soil surface and cuts those roots off of plants when they're very, very young. And you have to do this when the plants are, are very little. Otherwise, um, if you let the plants get too big, then you're thinking more into moving into hand pulling um, as your mechanical strategy. And so with hand pulling, you really want to get in there and remove the root, if at all possible. Get, get down in there and get that out of there. Um, just removing the top portion of the plant or just clipping off the top portion of the plant um, sometimes can cause regrowth of that same plant. And so, um, and as that plant is regrowing a little bit on the top, that root system is really just getting bigger and bigger. So when you're hand pulling, try to remove the entire root if you can. And you can use all kinds of tools to help you do this. You can use like they have the, a little pick uh, type tool there. There's one called a hori hori, which is more of a knife tool that goes down into the soil and, and helps you get to the bottom of that root and pop that weed out. So then after you've tried your mechanical methods, if those aren't successful, you might think about using biological controls or biological methods. Um, the picture in the upper right hand corner there is of the Palisade Insectary that's in the western slope and that's one location in Colorado where they're growing and rearing these um, biological insects for you to purchase and try out. So basically biological control is just this introduction of natural enemies and that those natural enemies can help reduce the population of those weed species by using these little organisms to, to feed on them um, or suppress their growth. There's also biological enemies or natural enemies for insects as well, but we're gonna to stick to the herbicide um, type method here or killing the, the weeds. Sometimes these biological methods are not always effective. They have to be done in the right situation. For example, um, 
the one that comes to mind are the bindweed mites that's mentioned in the example below. And that's also the picture there that you see. Um, you know, typically in a wet situation, they're not going to work as well as they would in a dry land type situation and with a lot of bindweed. Um, sometimes you require a large area of weeds to maintain this beneficial insect population. So, you know, generally speaking, they're not suited for these smaller areas, more on a large scale or on an acreage type situation. Um, but yeah, there are some examples there, field bindweed mites or gall midges or gall wasps um, for different types of weeds. And again, these work for insects as well, um, depending on the species. And then finally, when we get to the top of that pyramid, um, we've exhausted all of our other options. And so you may need to look at chemical methods or herbicides. Um, I'm not gonna talk about herbicide, herbicides a lot, but I do wanna mention a few key points. Always, always follow the directions on the label of any herbicide that you use. The pesticide labels are the law. They are based on research. They are based on um, trials and they're, they are what you need to do. Um, I do wanna point out that there are different signal words that come on herbicide um, packaging. And those range from the bottom to the top from caution to warning to danger or to danger poison. And just know that certain chemicals have more, um, you know, they're just more dangerous than others to use. And typically as a homeowner or as a resident, you're not purchasing things that aren't just a caution. So as I mentioned, herbicides should always be used as a last resort. Mechanical and cultural methods actually can result in better control for a longer period of time. And especially if you can keep on top of it and not allow those plants to go to seed. Herbicides can also cause unintended damage to other trees and plants in your landscape. And I, I do see this quite often. Um, there are a few products on the market that are um, pretty strong herbicides. Um, they'll, they'll be used to clear areas. They're meant more for parking lots and, and gravel lots. They're not meant for your flower bed. And I've seen, um, I've seen trees go down from too much use of those really strong broad spectrum herbicides. So make sure you know what you're using. Um, talk to your local extension office, talk to your master gardeners, talk to Tony's welcome. <laughs> Tony has welcomed your questions on specific herbicides today um, to find out if what you're using is really a good product. There's a couple different types of herbicides. There's pre-emergent herbicides. Those are usually ap applied prior to seed germination. They're gonna help suppress that seedling growth. And those typically come in granular forms. But then there's also post-emergent herbicides that you can apply to seedlings and grown plants, and they're gonna kill or damage that plant um, specifically. And so um, just be careful when you're using things that are sprays because you can often get um, drift or overspray. So I'm going to stop there with the um, management strategies. We'll, we'll quickly touch on the life cycles, and then we're going to start talking about different types of weeds. But I do see maybe there are some questions, or how are we doing in the chat there? I was just answering one. Oh, and I see Elle just answered it too about horticultural vinegar, because um, a lot of people ask about that stuff. Um, Number one, thirty percent hort vinegar is extremely dangerous stuff. That that can make you blind if you get it in your eyes. So a lot of people think because something's quote unquote organic, it's safe and they can be cavalier using it. Uh, and hort vinegar in particular is really dangerous stuff to. And it's got a danger label, by the way, folks. If you read the label, the signal words that that Amy just mentioned. So just because it's organic doesn't mean it's safe. I think it's really important to remember. Hort vinegar is not systemic, so it's just gonna burn the top of a plant off. And if it's bindweed, it's gonna grow back. So, yeah. but yeah, yeah, we're getting, just to anticipate the questions on hort vinegar, because I we get a lot of those and uh, yeah. be incredibly careful with that. Wear gloves, I, I wear, it is nasty, nasty stuff. And then I just, I just saw Michael's question come in about adding large amounts of salts to an area um, where you don't want plants to grow. Uh, it will kill the soil as well as it will kill your plants. So if you use things like salt, and correct me if I'm wrong, Tony, uh, but you're looking at long-term effects on your soil. And you, so yep. it's not recommended to be pouring salt on plants no. either. Nope. 
not a good idea. Yeah. So it really goes back to IPM. And I know it's not what people want to do. There's so many options out there for chemicals. To me, it's a little disturbing when I go to the, the you know, the hardware store and I see an, an entire aisle top to bottom full of, of chemicals. And I really want you guys to rethink that and think about mechanical control, think about cultural control. And if you do have to resort to those chemicals, um, spot spray, don't just blanket spray or blanket apply um, an herbicide to your landscape unless it's absolutely necessary. Um, because yeah, organic chemicals can be a problem. They can be dangerous. Um, you know, the, the conventional stuff can be dangerous or it, it may not be, but but it's just, it's very complex. And so I really do like for you guys to think about mechanical control first. That's what I do, so. But every now and then you do have to resort to a chemical. All right, let's move on to the life cycle of weeds. And so um, weeds can have, uh, there's three different types of life cycles basically that weeds can have. They can be annual weeds. And these are weeds that are gonna have, complete their growing, their, their life cycle in one growing season or one year. Um, these have to be controlled before you set the seed because then you're just going to get more plants produced after that. So prevent seed production. That's the key here. Um, biennials are going to require two growing seasons to complete their life cycle. With these, because they, they start out with vegetative growth, and usually that's in the form of a rosette, but then they go dormant for a winter and they come back the next season um, with a new vegetative growth, you actually have to prevent these um, you need to prevent the seed production as well as prevent those seedlings from establishing. So a little bit more work to get rid of the biennials. And then we have perennial weeds as well. And those are gonna be returning year after year. And you'll learn from some of the plants I'm gonna talk about that some of these weeds actually can be a combination of, of these different life cycles. But if you're working with perennial weeds, you have to prevent seed production, seedling establishment, and you have to kill that perennial plant as well. So um, no matter what type of weed you have though, if you wanna make it more simple, just remember, don't let them go to seed period. So let's start out with the annual weeds. And here are the ones I'm going to cover in the next few slides. We're going to go through these um, fairly um, quickly. And if you have questions, just pop those in the chat. And we'll try to answer them. So let's start out with kochia, kochia scoparia. This is um, probably one of the most common weeds that I've seen up and down the front range, um, this northern front range area over my time here. This is in the amaranth family, and we're going to cover several of these weeds in the amaranth family. Um, this is what you think of when you hear of a tumbleweed. When you see a tumbleweed, typically it's kochia. Now, there are other tumbleweeds out there. Um, the one that we're going to cover next is also a tumbleweed, Russian thistle, as well as blue mustard can even form a tumbleweed from time to time. So, um, with kochia, though, the most popular one, the most common one that we see, it's going to have these alternate narrow leaves that are going to have hairs along the, the margins and along that lower surface. They have a little bit of a fuzzy feel, especially when they're young. Um, they have very small green flowers at the base of those leaves as you move up that plant. And um, they're going to be showing up in late summer, early fall, as far as those flowers go. The growth of this plant, if you look in that lower left-hand picture, you can see that that growth hat kind of takes on a more of a pyramid shape at maturity. It can stay kind of rounded too, but I, I do typically see these more forming that pyramid shape. They are found in disturbed areas. They're going to outcompete other plants because they can grow really fast and they grow in very large numbers. So that middle picture on the top there, you can see several um, kochia seeds have germinated. And so you end up getting this, this carpet of little tiny seedlings that then grow up into these big plants. And then at the end of the season, um, there's a what's called an abscission layer at the base of that stem where the stem breaks off from the root and it's already dried down. And then it starts rolling and tumbling as in the tumbleweed and it's dropping its seeds all along the way. And it has lots and lots of seeds. Um, so with these, um, you, can, you can do some mulching to help prevent these. You can pull these, you can treat these with um, herbicides, but I will say that some, some kochia have become resistant to some post-emergent herbicides. So um, you may have to do your research, you may have to do a couple applications, and you may even have to add in something to help it penetrate into those fuzzy leaves. So um, 
So really, yeah, kosher is a problem. It's a problem everywhere. And it's, it's not an easy one to get rid of. One that's often confused with kosher and is also often seen alongside of kosher is Russian thistle. Um, Salsola tragus is the name of this one. And it's also, again, in the amaranth family. And it's the other tumbleweed. So, um, but the look of the leaves is very different. They're going to be very thin. They're just going to be about an inch to two inches long. And they're going to have a very soft feel when they're young. Um, it does have reddish colored striping along the stems, and that's common for a few different of these weeds in this family. It will pull very easily when it's young. So if you can get to this and the kochia when they're very young, um, you can just, you know, grow those out, and that's going to really help you in the long term. Um, this one does have more of a rounded shape, but it's very heavily branched. It gets those prickly spines on it as it matures. Um, also found in disturbed areas, just like the Russian, or just like the kochia. And again, with a tumbleweed, same mode of action, it's going to break off at the stem and start rolling and dropping its seeds as it rolls. Um, tumbleweeds, whether they're Russian thistle or they're kochia or some other kind of tumbleweed, they, they can collect along fences um, once they, they start rolling, and this can really be a fire hazard. And so um, another reason why this one is a weed to us. Couple more to cover in this amaranth family. The next one is lamb's quarter. This one's chenopodium, and there's different types of lamb's quarter out there. And um, so different areas of the United States have different species of this, but they're all considered weeds um, as far as I know. Um, you might also hear this called white goosefoot or goosefoot, different um, common names for it. But this one has similar qualities to the kochia and the, um, the Russian thistle, but it's not typically a tumbleweed. It's not going to break off and start rolling like they do. Um, the seedling, when it's really tiny, can kind of feel rough or wet to the touch. Um, those opposite leaves that start out opposite actually end up in an alternate pattern, which is kind of interesting. It does have these slightly toothed margins to the leaves, and it has a nice, um, like a white color to it. I don't know if it's nice, but it's a white color that'll help you identify it easier. Um, it can even look like it has a grayish tone to the plant. It gets these little flowers all along those upper stems and they look like little tiny balls and you'll see a lot of them. Um, and so that's one other way you can, you can identify this plant. And it's also commonly found in disturbed areas and in gardens. And just like the other two, get these when they're young, get them before they go to seed because they produce a lot of seeds per plant. And then the last one we're going to cover in this amaranth family as an annual um, is red root pigweed. This one is probably a little bit more common in areas with more moisture than it is in, in drier areas, but it's pretty fast growing once it gets that moisture, which is one reason why you want to get it early. Um, it also has alternate leaf patterns. It has these prominent veins on the leaves, and then they have a reddish tint um, to the underside of that leaf as well. This one, um, you can just pull it really easily. It pulls super easy. I pulled a lot of pigweed in my day. Um, and if you get to it early enough, you can, just, you can just pull it really quick. So get in there and get those while they're young, um, before those seed heads mature and before they start releasing those seeds. Because again, just like a lot of these other weeds, they produce lots of seeds per plant. You can also kill red root pigweed with herbicides, but I really say it only do this when the numbers are really high, just because it is so easy to pull. You might as well just pull this one. All right, a couple more in the annual family. Purslane, this one is really common in our garden beds and in our home landscapes. Um, the scientific name of this is Portulaca oleracea, but there's also um, Portulaca that are like bedding plants or flowering plants. And so same family, but this one is a weed and that one is not. So um, this type of purslane though, has a very thick and smooth and succulent leaf to it. And then as it gets older, it gets these little tiny yellow flowers. Um, I believe it's this one I read that this one can go to seed very, very quickly. And so you wanna make sure you're on top of these little purslanes and pulling them out as you go. Um, they are edible. You will find that different places in the world, they harvest these for, for food. Um, I have never tried it. <laughs> I always think of this more as a weed, and so I, I pull it. Um, it does have um, those little succulent leaves. They do attach right to the stem. They don't have petioles. That's another way you can identify it. 
And it creates these multiple stems that create this kind of mat like um, growth to it. But what's so interesting and great about that is even though you have the multiple stems, it's from a single tap root. And so if you pull just that one root and you get the whole root, you're going to pull up an entire, um, you know, maybe one foot area of plants. So it's very satisfying when you're pulling things like purslane because um, just one pull and you get a whole lot of area covered very quickly. One thing to note about purslane though is even though it does pull very easily from moist soil, it does reroot easily as well. So if you're using like a stirrupo or some kind of a cultivation type technique where you're just um, removing those quickly from the soil, you want to make sure you're disposing of those plants because even those little leaves can reroot and then um, you've got another weed there. So just, um, you know, as you're pulling, go ahead and throw those out. And then post-emergent herbicides can be effective on the young plants, but they are much more difficult to kill with herbicides once they get to be older. Oh, puncture vine, <laughs> probably the most hated weed along the, the front range area. So this one's Tribulus terrestris, and it's, it's in the Caltrop family, which are very commonly these pinnately um, pinnate type leaves on them. Um, but you might have heard of this one more as called a goat head. And the reason is, is that little seed can look like a little goat's head. That's how it has that name. But I think puncture vine is a little more fitting because it's it's a very, um, it's a very angry little seed that, that can puncture into your bike tires. It can puncture your skin very easily. It can get stuck on your shoes, stuck in your, even in your car tires, it can get stuck everywhere. Um, this one is commonly found at elevations below 6,500 feet and on the eastern side of Colorado. Um, I had my nephew, he came down and visited me a couple of years ago and he rode his bike along some trails and, and he went off the trail and he um, came back and he had probably, we had two, two popped tires and several goat heads in his tires. And he was not familiar with this because they don't have it up in that northern part of Wyoming where he lives. So um, it was a, a sore surprise for him to ride his bike down here and go off trail. So be careful out there um, because those little seed heads are, are just very dangerous. So this one will create another low growing mat forming type plant with um, uh, one single tap root for, for several stems. And so those stems can reach one to five feet in length and create this carpet. But if you can find that tap root and you pull it again, very satisfying because you can cover a large area with just one pool. Um, they do have the little small leaflets on them and they're about a half inch, um, they have half inch in size yellow flowers. And then those flowers turn into those spiny burrs that you can see in those bottom two pictures there. And those burrs can last 20 or more years in the soil. So a very long um, soil life. I've also seen people that once they pull these, they go back with something um, kind of rubber or something to, to kind of tamp the, the top of the soil to try to pick up any of those leftover seeds by getting them to stick to whatever it is they're, they're putting down. Um, if you've got like a knee board or something that's kind of a foam, you'll, you can use that to kind of pick up those extra seeds. Um, so pull, pull it, it does pull easily in more moist soil, but you really do need to wear leather gloves or heavy gloves because those little um, seeds will puncture even leather gloves. So you have to be very, very careful when doing this. Um, mulch can be effective to reduce these populations. We oftentimes see it growing where there's no other ground cover around, um, no mulch or no other plants. You can use biological controls. There's a weevil out there that can attack the stem or the seed. I think there's two different weevils actually, and those are available. But again, I think you need to have a large population of this for those to be effective. Puncture vine is listed on our noxious weed list. It's on our C list, um, which means that it's up to the local communities, the local municipalities to say whether or not and they're going to regulate the control of that, but there are tools out there from um, CDA to help you make good decisions on how to control this as well. So herbicides can be effective when those plants are really small, um, but you will have to make repeated applications because this is a tough one to get rid of. Hey, Amy. Um, yeah. A, a quick a little hint for a, yeah. a puncture vine. If you don't have a huge area, uh, getting cheap paint rollers, the fuzzy ones, and then yeah. just rolling it on the ground is really a good way to pick up a lot of puncture vine seed. 
All right, blue mustard. This is another one you'll you'll very commonly see around this time of year. This is in the mustard family, and I'm going to cover a couple in the mustard family. Um, and these are what we call winter annuals. So winter annuals, the seeds are going to germinate in the late summer or fall. Um, they're going to overwinter as a rosette, and then in the spring, um, the plant's going to grow up in, in the early spring, and then it's going to flower pretty quickly and, and turn to seed. And so with this one, it has um, really, it, this is one that's kind of that borderline attractive, right? Like some people really like blue flowers and they might say, oh, I want to plant this in my yard. But this one, this gets out of control very quickly. And it is, um, it is a weed. <laughs> so there's other plants out there that have pretty blue flowers for you. Um, but it does get those blue flowers with four petals in the spring. The stems are slightly hairy. It has these oval shaped leaves with these um, kind of these uh, widely spaced tooth margins. It does have a very thick taproot. The seeds can be viable um, after just 10 days um, after blooming. And so it's, it's a very short window of once that starts flowering that you need to take care of it um, before you're going to get seed set. Um, so some things that are good for prevention. Healthy soil, is good for prevention of this. Mulch can help prevent this and competition from desirable plants can help prevent this because this is one that typically grows in unhealthy soils where there is no competition. And you can see that um, in the picture, both of those pictures there, very sandy soils that just really don't have a lot going. There's dry, no nutrients. And this is where that will show up. Um, there are some chemical controls available for this, but you have to use those very early. And where we really see this as a big issue is for some of our um, crop growers that are growing these early season crops or that are growing alfalfa. And so it can be a problem on a large scale for some people. Another one in the mustard family, this is flixweed. Um, I practiced how to say the scientific name of this <laughs> several times, and I'm going to give it a shot. Descuramlia sophia. Uh, it's my best shot. Um, but this one is in the mustard family as well. It's also a winter annual, so it's going to germinate in that late summer, early fall, and then it's going to overwinter, and then it's going to pop up um, in the early spring. With, with Usually this is the part of the plant that you see. It's hard to find the... the um, the first part of the, the life cycle on this one. But they do produce these little tiny, small, pale yellow flowers that show up in clusters. And you can see in that, that bottom picture there, I'm kind of cupping one of those flowers and you can see those little clusters. But then just below that, you see those narrow seed pods that come out um, kind of radiating around the stem. Another early spring weed, as I mentioned, you'll find this one now. It, it's actually probably on its way out. Um, it's probably already gone to seed in most places. It does have a short tap root, so this one's pretty easy to, to pull up. Um, just want to get it before it goes to seeds because those seeds as you're pulling can be dropping and they're, you know, very prolific. Um, you can use shallow cultivation as well to help when this plant is very young, um, but hand pulling is pretty effective. There are some chemical controls available for this plant as well. And then the last one I'm going to cover for the annuals is another winter annual, totally different family though. We're going to move over to the grass family. And this one is cheat grass and um, very common around this northern front range area. In fact, this one is pretty common in grasslands across the west. And so um, it's a noxious weed in several states. As I mentioned, this one's another winter annual. The plant is really going to reach maturity in early spring, and it's going to be brown by summer. So the first um, picture you see there in the upper left, that's probably what most of the time you're going to see because most of us don't start looking for weeds um, that early in the year. So I'm talking end of February, March into early April is when you really need to get a hold of that cheatgrass and, and take care of it. Once those seed heads start to turn this reddish brown color, they're too mature for chemical control and, and they're already viable. And so um, if you are going to be using chemical control, you need to do that very early before that seed matures um, when it's still green and still soft and still pliable and you can kind of squish it. Um, once it gets older and it gets harder, those chemicals aren't going to be working anymore. Um, so let's back up a little bit. Um, the height of this plant can vary anywhere from three inches to 30 inches, depending on the site. 
It has this crooked head um, of seeds that's going to kind of crook over to one side. There's other grass species that look similar to this, but once you start recognizing cheat grass and the fact that it's so early in the season is, is really one of those key identifying features. Um, and as I mentioned, those will turn brown and then they'll, the plant will die very early. Um, very common to find along roadsides, very common to find in disturbed sites, but it's also invading some of our grasslands. And so that's why it's on that noxious weed list. It's, it's on list C and it is also a fire hazard because you have to imagine if you got all that brown dead plant material through the middle of the summer um, when fire hazard is high, then it can um, easily cause some issues. And as I mentioned, get this one early before those seeds are, are going to mature. You can hand pull this you can, if this is in a pasture situation, you can early graze this, but as it matures, it becomes an issue for livestock. Um, and there are chemical options available, but again, early, early, early is the key. So let's stop real quick, see if we have any questions on those annuals I just covered. And then um, if not, we'll roll into some biennial weeds. How are we doing guys? We're good. You know, one, one other thing about that cheat grass is if it does get too far along um, to, to spray it. Um, that, uh, and I, I did this on six acres of my own property uh, to, be, to, to win the cheatgrass battle is to mow it and bag it and just pile it somewhere. And those seeds, they only live for probably two or three years and then the seed's no longer viable. So it's one of those weeds that has very short seed viability. Um, so, but that's that's a pretty good way of battling cheatgrass. If you, if you don't want to spray it, um, yeah, is just bag up those those seed heads. But wait till it gets almost ready to to drop its seed and then do it. Otherwise, it'll regrow and reflower, and then it'll form seeds below the mowing height of your mower. So, yeah, good. That's if, good it's, a, point. That's if it's in a place where you can mow, not yeah. in a flower bed, obviously, but. Yeah, this um, the upper the upper right hand picture there is a situation where you probably couldn't mow if that's in a flower bed, but that just shows you how quickly this stuff can get out of control. And then, I mean, to re resort to hand pulling an area that wide, um, that's a choice that I, you'll have to make. <laughs> but yeah, thanks for those tips, Tony. Um, that's really great to think about mowing it as well. And again, that's a good IPM strategy before you get to that um, chemical control. All right, let's, let's look at some biennial weeds. So I'm just gonna cover a few of these that are the most common ones that I've seen um, in, in the past few years. So let's start with Western salsify or salsify. Different people say it different ways, but I say salsify. Um, this one's tragopodon, pogon dubious. Um, it is dubious. <laughs> it's in the aster family. And this one's often confused with dandelion just because of the, the seed head on it looks very similar, although it's um, much, much bigger than a dandelion um, poof ball, for lack of a better term there. Um, but salsify is, is really adapted to a wide, wide range of habitats um, found in disturbed areas. This one is one of those examples where it was introduced as a garden plant. Um, so people thought it looked pretty and then it, it got out of control, started escaping and um, now it's, it's a weed. Um, it does have alternate long narrow leaves. They're very hairy when they're young, but then they get waxy as they get older. Excuse me, it's similar to a dandelion. It also has those hollow flower stalks, which is another reason it's commonly mistaken. Um, but those stalks, again, are much bigger, so they can get one to three feet in height. So it starts out as this grass-like rosette in its first year and then throws that stalk up with those flower heads in its second year. So again, that's that biennial life cycle. Um, this one's pretty easy to control, though, with hand pulling. Um, you can use mulch also to help reduce that, that seed germination. But you, just like the dandelion, you can see that seed head has lots of seeds. They have um, they have dispersal mechanisms on them that allow them to go far and wide. So it's not just dropping seed right where that plant's at. This is one um, similar to this dandelion, Canada thistle. They've got those fine hairs on them that act like wings and they, they travel. So try to get these before they go to seed. Um, you can keep these mowed down as well um, before they go to seed to help control them. 
But look at the picture on the upper left there, just how that's the, the rosette stage, the first year stage, and, and just look how long that taproot is. Um, so if you can get them in that stage, that's really great. But in a situation where it's mixed in with grass, it's oftentimes hard to distinguish um, between those rosettes and, and the actual grass species. Common mullein is another one that we see. Uh, this is verbascum thapsus. And this is in the figwort family, also a biennial. This one um, is considered to be naturalized in many areas of the United States. It was actually introduced prior to the Revolutionary War. So way back in the beginning of our country's history, this was brought over and, and was planted or introduced for some reason or another. And now um, you might hear even some people say it's native, but it's naturalized, it's not native. Um, it is on the noxious weed list. Common mullein is on list C. There's another mullein that's on list B, which is a little bit more um, of an issue, but we don't see it as often. We, what we're typically seeing is common mullein, and that's, again, on that list C noxious weed list. And the reason it's on there, um, well, there's multiple reasons, but one of the reasons is it produces over 200,000 seeds per plant, and those seeds are viable for over 100 years in some cases. So this is one that's a very long-standing weed that's just very hard to get rid of once you have it. Um, it does have an extensive, very fibrous root system as well as a tap root system. So a fibrous root system just has lots of tiny little feeder roots whereas that tap root is that single root that goes down. So you combine both of those together, this has got a really strong root system. Um, that rosette of leaves, as you can see in the first couple pictures there at the top, is gonna be really fuzzy and covered in dense hairs. And then in the, in the next year, it's gonna get the stalk that can grow anywhere from two to eight feet tall. And then those leaves, they have a similar look to the rosette, but they get um, smaller as you move up that stem. And so the bottom leaves are gonna be very big, but the top leaves are gonna be kind of smaller. You really wanna be monitoring this and you really wanna to try to contain this when it's in that rosette stage, whether that's by pooling or just a quick cultivating and knocking that you know plant off the root. Um, there are biological controls available for this in the form of a weevil. Again, it has to have the right situation and you have to have a big enough outbreak to keep that population of weevils going. Um, there are specific chemical herbicides available. Um, you really need to do your research on this one if you are going to be using chemicals because it's very difficult to penetrate through that very hairy surface when you're trying to control it at that rosette stage. So, um, you know, depending on what you're, you choose to do to control it, um, just do your research first, but try to get this one at the rosette stage. And then I think this is the last biennial we're going to cover in this section. This is prickly lettuce. This is Lactuca cereola, excuse me, also in the aster family, like a couple other ones that we've seen. This one, um, this one is growing in disturbed areas and it actually prefers more of those dry conditions. The leaves on this are pretty, once you recognize them, they're pretty easy to spot. They look, they have this irregularly lobed look to them. They almost look like a pin oak leaf. If you're familiar with the oak leaves, some of those have really deep sinuses. They look very similar. Um, one way you can identify these though is to flip that leaf over and along the midrib on the underside of the leaf, you'll find these spines. And that's one, again, really easy way to identify this, whether it's in the rosette stage, as in the upper pictures, or whether it's the mature stage um, in the lower picture, it will continue to have those, those uh, spines along the midrib. It does exudate a, a milky type substance from its stems when it's cut. Um, it can be irritating for some people, so wear gloves when you're pulling this. Also because of those spines, they can, they can hurt your hands. Um, it has a yellow daisy-like flower that gets that same kind of little um, puffball type look to it. Those seeds will disseminate far and wide um, with the help of those little hairs. And so super easy to pull though. You can get out there and pull prickly lettuce. If you got a good heavy pair of gloves, you can pull this really quickly, whether it's the mature adult type, um, second year stage, or whether it's in the rosette, they're pretty easy to pull. Um, much easier too if the ground is, is moist. And then I want to cover in the last few minutes we've got left just a few of the perennial weeds. Um, these are some of the more uh, difficult weeds to control, and they're also more prevalent across the entire um, Northern Front Range area. 
And so let's start with um, Canada thistle, everyone's favorite, right? Um, this is Cerisium ervins, and this is in the composite family. It is also on the noxious weed list. This one's on list B. So again, a little bit more um, regulation around this one because it's, it's much more widespread and, and a, a pretty big problem um, for most of us. The reason that Canada thistle is so hard to get rid of is it spreads by these horizontal roots that can be very deep rooted, sometimes up to a couple feet below the soil surface if they're in the right spot. Um, the leaves have this slightly grayish tone. They're gonna be smooth on the underside. The edges are gonna kind of curl over and they have spines along the margins and on the foliage itself um, and on the stems as well. The purple flowers um, are very numerous. They're not very big. And there's a lot of different thistles out there. So really, um, you know, try to identify this one correctly because there's also some other thistles that are, that are good thistles. But, um, but those purple flowers are gonna be very numerous. You're gonna see a lot of them. So just that one big um, thistle flower. And again, with the seeds, that with the hairs and the tufts of hairs that help them fly around and spread, um, for, for Canada thistle, where I see this mostly is in places that have been very disturbed, um, construction sites, if, if, you know, a neighborhood is getting built and they've cleared an area and they haven't built quickly on that area, it will just pop up with thistle everywhere, um, Canada thistle. So really encouraging plant competition is a good way to help keep it down. Um, in the lawn situation, same thing. If you have a healthy lawn, that's going to help outcompete that thistle. Um, so over time, that's going to be the way that you can manage it. Pulling is not always effective with this thing because of that extensive root system. Um, you know, you can pull, but then you're going to have, you're going to get more coming up because it will reroute from that, that, that really deep lateral or horizontal root. So you can continually pull and eventually you can starve that root system out. So this is just one that you're gonna have to stay on top of, stay diligent um, and, and just keep going at it. Um, there are biological insects, but they're not effective in backyard situations. In fact, I'm not, I'm not really familiar with those um, control methods. And chemical control might be necessary in combination with um, those other methods as well. So it may get to the point where you've pulled and pulled and you're not exhausting it and then you need to do some spot spraying with some chemicals to really get to that um, deep root. Dandelion. So Taraxacum officinale. This is one I, I hesitated putting dandelion in the presentation today because it can be a little controversial. Um, you know, dandelions, some people love them, some people hate them. Um, some people eat them. Some people think they're just nothing but a weed. And so that, you know, it's a, it's a tough one to cover, um, but I'll, I'll do my best here. So it's in the aster family. It's what we call a short-lived perennial. So it sticks around for a few years, um, but then it'll regenerate and the new plant will stick around for a few more years. It grows widely in a variety of spaces. It grows in lawns, it grows in garden beds, it grows in the cracks in the pavement. It grows just about anywhere. It has these lance-shaped leaves that start out as this rosette, as you can see in the upper two pictures. And sometimes those leaves are entire margins and sometimes they're lobed, they're tooth-type margins. It can be variable depending on the plant. Even on the same plant, you can get a variety of different leaf shapes. And so, um, so identifying this is really much easier if you look for those yellow flowers. And those are gonna pop up in the early spring and they're gonna continue to bloom throughout the summer. Um, they do have stems that contain that milky sap. They also have that hollow stem, just like the salsify. Um, so a couple of different methods you can use to help combat the dandelions or manage the dandelions is increasing your mowing height, maintaining a healthy lawn. If you have dandelions in the lawn, that just means that your lawn is not quite as healthy as it probably could be um, with competing out those plants. And so um, increase your mowing height, you know, stay on top of your watering and your fertilization schedules, make sure that those are adequate to help keep that lawn healthy. You can use mechanical control. You need to get all of that root if you can, or at least two to three inches of that root because it can generate new plants from those root pieces. So um, mechanical control is another great way to try to get to this 
but again, you have to you have to be very um, thorough and get the whole root. And then there are chemical options available. However, I will say I think it's best to spot spray those chemical options. Um, you know, you want to be thinking about that. Um, spot spraying is always a better option than again just blanket spraying an area. And I'm sure there's some questions that came in on that, but I've just got a couple more plants I'm going to cover and then we'll stop for some questions at the end. So field bindweed is our next perennial. And this one's in the morning glory family. This is Convolvulus arvensis. And um, it is a perennial. So it comes back year after year. It has these arrow shaped leaves that are anywhere from a half inch to up to four inches in length, depending on the site depending on the water amount as well. Um, when I see this in dry situations, those leaves tend to be a lot smaller, um, kind of in this middle picture here on the right that you can see, whereas if it has water, those leaves will be a little bit bigger on the left. Um, it does have somewhat pretty flowers. <laughs> they are um, actually five fused petals that form this corolla or this funnel shape. They can be white, they can be pink or pink with white stripes. They have very long seed life to them, and that seed can persist in the soil for up to 50 years. Um, it does have a tap root, and that root system also develops very quickly. And the plant grows very quickly as well. Even at low temperatures, this plant can be growing. So um, I think it starts growing around mid 50s in temperature, um, but even as low as in the 30s, it can still um, be alive and thriving. So it has this creeping, climbing habit. That's what makes chemical control so difficult with this one, especially when it's interwoven with other plants that are desirable. And so to manage this really just repeated removal of those stems, trying to exhaust that root system, you might even combine the herbicide applications with that management and that of, of mechanical control um, to really try to get that, that root system killed off because that root system is very extensive and, um, and that's what puts it on the noxious weed list. So this one's on our list C for noxious weeds. So bindweed, everyone hates bindweed. And then the last one I wanna to cover today is common mallow. This is Malva neglecta. This is in the mallow family. This one can be an annual, biennial, or perennial based on its growing conditions. But um, I learned this morning from Tony that this one is mostly perennial in Colorado. So um, it's gonna grow as a mat. And that mat's gonna be anywhere from four inches to two feet in height. And it's gonna be um, a very deep and a very branched tap root. So that lower um, left-hand pic or lower right-hand picture there, you can see how tiny the upper portion of the plant is, and then just how big that root is. Um, so a very extensive root system. Um, it's very common to find this in planting beds and in lawns where we have a little bit more moisture. It has these round frilly leaves and, um, they, they're about just maybe an inch in size, um, thick hairy stems, it has flowers that are white to pink, and you can hand pull this prior to it setting those seeds. This, you really need to get deep and get that root out. Um, maintaining healthy plant competition and mulch can help keep these from showing up in your garden. And if you do need to, to treat with chemicals, um, just spot treat for those. Um, but you can dig these. They just have a, a pretty deep root system and you really got to get down there and get it out. So with that, um, I just want to point out that there are lots of resources out there on the web for you, as well as in your local counties. Um, you can go to our CSU Extension website. You can check out Plant Talk articles and then also contact your Weld or your Larimer County Weed Departments if you need more help with specific recommendations or um, if you have acreage. And then if you have just general gardening questions or you want to help um, with identifying a certain weed or a plant, you can contact your Weld County or your Larimer County Master Gardeners. Um, both their email addresses are there. And then also you can email me directly.